All right. Good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, January 27th, and this is General Housing Military Affairs. We are here this morning with um, the Reverend Mark Hughes from uh, the Racial Justice Alliance, and we are going to um, hear testimony today on age 387. Um, which is dealing with putting together a committee to talk to do research and to talk about um, chattel slavery. Mark will Mark will give us. Um, we've had a walkthrough. We've had an introduction and a walkthrough on this bill. Um, committee for the rest of today. Um, just as a reminder, we will be uh, taking up H three twenty after this testimony, and we'll be having some witnesses conversation with possible vote. Uh, and then this afternoon, depending on how long the floor is, uh, we will be getting some help on IT. And then, uh, again, depending on how much time we have, then we'll talk about the adjutant general bills that are before us. But today's focus is on H387. I wanted to um, turn the microphone over to Mark. Um, welcome to the General Housing and Military Affairs. Committee, Mark, before we start, um, we'd just like to introduce ourselves, those of us that are here. Some of us are in the room. Some of us are on Zoom. Um, I guess I'll go with the folks that are on Zoom first. If you can actually, I think, I think folks on Zoom, if you could do this alphabetically, if you can figure that out quickly. Um, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> That would be that would be so much easier than me pointing to people saying you, 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 and you. So representative. Howard. Howard, yes. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I am Mary Howard. I represent uh, Rutland Southwest District. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Mark. It's John Kalaki from South Burlington. Good to see you here. Glad you're here. Good to see you. Uh -oh. JP. Uh, John. <laughs> JP, you're here. Yeah. Oh, I hate it when I do that. <laughs> Good to see you again, Mark. Uh, John Pulasic, uh representing Milton. Good to see you. John Chip Troiano, we've already kind of exchanged our greeting. Uh, I represent Hardwick Standard and Weldon. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And I'm always at the end of the alphabet. Uh, Representative Tommy <laughs> Waltz, uh, representing Barry City. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. How you doing, Mark? Uh, Matt Byron, representative from Virgins, representing uh, five municipalities in Northwest Edison County. Hello, Mark. Tiff Bloomley, <clears throat> fellow Burlingtonian, representing the South End. I'm hey. Joe Parsons. I represent Newberry, Topsom, and Groton. Hey, Rep. Parsons. Barbara Murphy. <laughs> Barbara Murphy, I represent Fairfax, uh, serving Franklin, too. And I uh, represent Tom Stevens. I live in Waterbury, representing Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buells Gore. And uh, we'll be joined by Representative Hango at some point uh, soon. So, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Good morning to you, and, and also uh, good morning to the committee. It's good to be back uh, in the committee. I know um, you have been very busy. Uh, since I was here last, I want to just thank you, first of all, for the uh, invitation and also thank you for the work that y'all are doing. Uh, it's uh, pretty important stuff. For the record, uh, my name is uh, the Reverend Mark Hughes. Uh, I am the executive director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and Justice for All. I'm also a minister here at New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church, the only uh, church that worships in the African-American tradition in the state of Vermont. Uh, I am the uh, senior vice chair, uh, the senior vice commander of Post 782 uh, here in Burlington, the veterans of foreign war. You may find that relevant in this committee. And I look forward to engaging uh, with you on some of the emerging uh, policy that's coming uh, our way on um, uh, that's uh, on our as veterans. Um, so uh, again, I am uh, a retired army officer. Uh, I uh, have been retired since uh, the late 90s. Uh, I'm really pleased to, to join you here in House General uh, and speak with you about H4, uh, 387, which is an act relating to establishing the task force to study 
and develop uh, reparation proposals uh, for the institution of uh, shadow slavery. We are the originators of the bill, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and um, therefore clearly we, you know, I, I appear in very strong support of the policy, strongly support uh, this, uh, this policy. I would um, at the top and I will uh, emphasize again at the closing of remarks, um, would urge you to take additional testimony uh, on this policy. I, I strongly urge you to do so. Um, I am aware uh, that the bill has been uh, introduced strongly. Um, I've sat through that entire thing as well as a walkthrough with Ledge Council. I've uh, viewed those videos in their entirety. Um, I've come hopefully to um, fill in the blanks, if you will, of some of the questions that you may have had uh, during that engagement. I thought it was um, very, uh, it was a robust and extremely, uh, I think, helpful discussion. Uh, that you engaged in with Ledge Council as well as with uh, Representative China. And I think uh, after today's testimony, you will find that perhaps I may have filled in some of the blanks that you uh, were left with. And hopefully you can take that to the next level and we will be able to take additional testimony and, and get uh, more folks in to, to talk about this. Hopefully uh, during that process, we can get some folks in who are in opposition of this policy. I strongly encourage uh, you to get folks in and listen very closely to the opposition to this policy. I know that may sound strange coming from someone who's supporting this policy, but we are so confident uh, in what it is that this policy is seeking to do that to date, um, we don't feel as though we've heard any uh, real substantive opposition to this policy that would cause you to believe that somehow or another it is a bad idea. Uh, so I just lay that out transparently. And I think those of the committee, Mr. Chair, uh, know that I do have a way of communicating very transparently. And I just wanted to just challenge the committee with that. Please take as much testimony on this policy as possible and make a sound decision I have witnessed the deliberations of this committee and I'm confident uh, in the judgment of this committee given the, um, the facts, uh, given uh, all of the details. And I think that you will uh, do the right thing. I'm gonna go through a, a, a few slides if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. And, and if, um, if, that's, if that would be permitted. Of course, I, I noticed that you've been made a co-host and if Ron has made you a co-host, Please, please share. Thank you. I do struggle with um, this uh, presentation uh, mode over here, mostly because there's there's a I have some kind of challenge that preclude that precludes me from being able to provide a full um, a, a presentation view and advance the slides. So please bear with me. And what we will do is we will work through this. I think what I may be able to do is, is to simply um, enhance this as such. And perhaps if that's uh, visible to those who are on the call, can you please acknowledge? It is. Thank you very much. So again, thank you for, uh, for having, having me here. And I uh, wanted to just take a brief moment just to be explicit about the mission of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance to secure sustainable power, ensure agency, and provide security for American descendants of slavery while embracing their history and preserving their culture. So that is our mission want to take a, also a brief moment to circle around, if you will, on the definition of systemic racism. There are many. We have taken the time to do the research. We also offer a presentation, which is a part of our outreach and education series the definition of systemic racism is what it is entitled. 
we've come to the conclusion that through the use of the book, Racist America, Roots, Current Realities and Future Reparations, Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey arrive at what we believe is the best conclusion to the definition of systemic racism, given your work in R113, declaring racism as a public health emergency and your commitment to eradicate it, this definition we view as being very important. Systemic racism involves both the deep structures and the surface structures of racial oppression. It includes the complex array of anti-Black practice, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continuing economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, and the emotion-laden racist framing created by whites to maintain and rationalize their privilege and power. Systemic racism thus encompasses the dominant white racial frame with its white racist attitudes, ideologies, emotions, images, and narratives, as well as the discriminatory actions and institutions flowing out of the and linked to that frame. This racism is material, social, ideological, reality, and indeed systemic, which means that racist reality is manifested in all major institutions, that is, Racist America, uh, Roots, Current Realities, and Future Reparations, whereupon which we built the foundation of the discussion, which erected the scaffolding of the conversation and the policy surrounding systemic racism in the legislature to date. I wanted to stop for a minute and acknowledge the deep data work that is ongoing across the state and indeed across the nation, which previously has not existed for decades. And, and it is in this generation where we uncover um, much of the data, the empirical data, the quantitative data, but also the qualitative data that illustrates these disparities uh, discussed on the aforementioned slide. Our data team with the Racial Justice Alliance continues that work. You may find this data and more like it on our website. Very important in the work that we do not to create a conversation that is merely antidotal. The work that we are doing also has led to a discovery and I believe this 242 may be off. I think that should be about 244 now, maybe 245. Our work has led us to the, uh, the, the amendment of the Vermont Constitution. I think this is relevant, not just because the House government operations has passed with a vote of 10 to one out the PR, PR2 to the floor, which you will be asked to take action on, on Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken, of next week. But it's also important to understand that it is tied, it is interlinked with the broader conversation. Because as we're having a conversation about addressing systemic racism, as we're having a conversation about abolishing slavery, if, if, as we're having a conversation about the economic impacts, as we're having all of these conversations at the same time, we've got to weave all of this together and try to stay focused on who we are as a nation and how all of this started. We also, in addition to the data that you saw on the last slide, it's also important to pay close attention instead of debating whether we should you know, teach true history in our schools, uh, instead of um, you know, constructing um, you know, opposing views on the data that we see, we have to marry it to the true history of this nation. And that is a process because there's a lot of it that's buried and it kind of gets to part of 
the policy of 387, because part of the policy of 387, much of the policy of 387, has everything to do with unearthing many of the things that we probably don't currently have or understand. In fact, much of the work that we did, uh, we have done to date with this constitutional amendment, you don't know about because we haven't had the opportunity to share with you. And the press isn't really very interested in picking that up or, ex or explaining it to you. Besides, it's a very difficult conversation for a Vermonter, um, especially a second or a third or a fourth generation Vermonter, and frankly, to some extent, even myself, to come to terms with the fact that Vermont was the first state to ever constitutionalize slavery. Now that's a very much, that's a very different story from Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery. But the truth is that there was never a state that had the language in its constitution of slavery before Vermont in 1777. And I use this as an example is because it was only through our research that we discovered this and with our national partners, the Abolish Slavery National Network. This is relevant because again, there are many things that we don't know that must be uncovered. Because the reason why it's important is, is that we would know our true history so we don't repeat our mistakes, but it's also important if we're talking about some type of apology or some type of restitution, or in this case, reparations, we should at least get to a point to where we understand why it is we're doing it, or if we should even do it at all. Now, Ohio, Oregon, and then later, very late, Alabama would go on to include slavery within their constitutions, also the Northeast uh, Regional Territory. Um, but it was used as a model in developing the United States Constitution and certainly the 13th Amendment, which also has very much like the Vermont Constitution, which has three exception clauses, the 13th Amendment has one exception clause. So it was modeled, the 13th Amendment was modeled after the exception clause that predates it from 1865 all the way back to 1777. That is the truth. That is our history. So the relevance of that is very important because then we'd have to talk about our role in the establishment, say for example, our being our state, and the perpetuation, not just of prison slavery, but if you move past that, convict leasing, convict leasing. So we'll talk more about that later, but I wanna move on and just tell you that we're not just here doing platforms and initiatives, which we refer to as policy. Uh, the Alliance, we're doing a bunch of other work in other areas. So uh, outreach and education is one, uh, community engagement and support is another, and also there is the area of cultural empowerment. And I think uh, the flagship of cultural empowerment to date has been the, um, the first African landing day, which is actually hosted in, at Intervale uh, every, in, in every August. I think I saw uh, Representative Bloom there. In fact, I think we had an extensive conversation about a lot of stuff that I'm talking about right now. Uh, I wanna make you also aware that here in the city of Burlington, through the partnership with, uh, with uh, community partners and so forth, what we're doing is, is we, we've also launched what we call the Richard Kemp Center, where uh, there is a community center, youth activity center, arts and science uh, programming um, and wellness, based adult basic education, basic computer skills and the like. Um, workforce development, uh, financial support, grants assistance, all of this, is targeted at the, the same thing. This is relevant because this policy solution is not the only way that we address these issues. I think it's really, really important for us to embrace if we're talking about, we're not talking about let's, you know, pass a legis let's pass a policy that says that, you know, we have a reparations task force. That's a very small of a much larger solution to a very old problem that we're addressing. And that's all I'm really trying to illustrate here. And if and you deserve that, uh, Mr. Chairman, and your committee, you deserve to get the, the broader scope of the work that is being done 
uh, to address systemic racism in Vermont because you are a part of it, but you are not all of it. And whether you move this policy or not, we will continue this work. And we'll be back and there'll be other policy that we'll talk about. Since we are here to talk about platforms and initiatives, it's, I guess it's, I should share with you that our um, platforms and initiatives are our legislative agenda, if you will, this year at a statewide level. And it's important to distinguish that because we have, we have, a, we have a local uh, uh, policy initiative here in the city of Burlington. But at the statewide level, you probably heard acknowledge, create, and transform. Acknowledge rec and reconcile historic systems of racism, new structures for community empowerment would be create and transform state systems and public safety. That's going to be our transform. And you see there, there's a list of policies that we're working uh, across the legislature currently at the state level. We know that the um, the public health emergency, as well as the health wellness bill, uh, which became Act 33, have moved. Um, we know that on Tuesday, it is likely that the House will move PR2. Uh, we, our, our fingerprints are on and we support uh, H273. You will see, you, are, you have already had H406 introduced to you. This is the economic piece as it pertains to policy. I heard Representative Bloom ask the question, hey, what's the difference between reparations and say policy? It, policy can be reparative, yes. H406 specifically intended to address these challenges of uh, addressing um, systemic racism on an economic level with policy. So very, very intentional, just like H210 was very, very intentional uh, on the health front. So yes, 406, we must come back and take testimony up and have conversation about that. Cannabis equity over in the um, uh, government or house, house government operations is, as well as quality of life outcomes in the Senate. And we'll talk more about that on another time. This is a, a, a broader scope of some of the things that we're doing with policy regarding this, this, uh, this work. And I know that represent, Representative Chena came in and showed you some of this, and we still haven't captured all of this. And But whoever put this slide together is just, I think, is trying to tell us that those last two items on the statewide, um, th that's where we are right now. Both of those are in this committee. Both of those are in this committee. So we get a chance to know each other. There's, a, there's some things happening over in Burlington too, which I'm not gonna bore you with because I, I wanna keep it moving. And, and um, I, th I think what I may do is, is I may just pause for a moment in just a second, just um, Mr. Chair, if that's okay, just to see if we can go to any questions to up until this point, but what I'll, I'll just drudge on just maybe a couple more slides. I did wanna remind you of the work that you did in H113, R113 uh, with specific attention on the resolution itself that the legislative body commits to coordinating work and participating in ongoing action grounded in science and data to eliminate race-based race health disparities and eradicate systemic racism. Uh, you also said that uh, you committed to a, the sustained and deep work of eradicating systemic racism throughout the state actively fighting racist practices and participated in the creation of a more just and equitable system or systems. Thank you. Uh, I, pre I appreciate that work and I've watched it in real time last year and it looks on this paper a lot easier than it was for you last year with the failure to be able to suspend the rules to communicate it over to the Senate in a timely manner uh, and the votes um, in the dissent of this uh, policy, uh, they were noted. And I think we should all acknowledge them, maybe not focus on them, but it is important to understand that once the body um, made a statement that it is yours and um, I appreciate, we appreciate it and we, we stand you know, to, to partner with you. One of the things that we did to um, move this advances forward, which it's been more like crickets and hearing from the legislature, uh, even the SEC, which um, the SEC, we, we work with, we work around, we work through, 
um, because they, you know, at the Racial Justice Alliance, we're not going to vet everything that we're doing through a sub body, the you know, Black Affinity Group or the, you know, the SEC. And, and not only that, just to be transparent, and I don't mind saying it, and, I, and please uh, mark this for the record, this is not a political conversation. Uh, to address systemic racism. Uh, this has nothing to do with the left or the right. It has everything to do with right or wrong. So we're not going to relegate ourselves uh, to the SEC or any other body. We'll be coming directly at the legislature in these policies because, again, this is not political. Uh, this, is a, this is right or wrong. Uh, so thank you for uh, 113. Um, I wanted to bring your attention because this is one of the pieces that I think you missed. And it wasn't your fault because uh, I didn't see it come from ledge council. And I, I don't have um, positive things to say about the presentation that came from ledge council. It's unfortunate, but it's true because um, I don't I don't think that they've done your homework. So ledge council, as you're watching, please do your homework. I'm going to give you some uh, here today. Um, but, uh, you know, in matters like this and issues like this, I think it's important that all of us acknowledge, you know, take our jackets off, roll our sleeves up and say, hey, folks, uh, let's do the work. Uh, we really need to do the work here. And it shouldn't take, uh, you know, if, if we have a legion of lawyers that are sitting down there in ledge console, then all it takes is, you know, a fifth grader could go and do a, 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 a Google search on some of the things that we're talking about and come up with some of the conclusions that I will share with you. And if that sounds blistering, it's intended to do so because this is important work. And, and attorneys, when you're down there doing the work, we expect you to do the work just like you would in any other issue. This is what the United Nations says. It says there is a profound need to acknowledge that the transatlantic trade and Africans enslavement, col colonialization and, and colonialism, colonization and colonialism were a crime against humanity and are among major sources and manifestations of racism, racial discrimination, Afrophobia, xenophobia, and related intolerance. Past injustices and crimes against African Americans need to be addressed with reparatory justice. So they go on to encourage Congress to pass HR 40. This is the United Nations in 2016. This is the um, report of the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent in its mission to the United States. This is a subgroup of the Human Rights Council. I want to define um, uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'd like to define reparations. But before I do, um, and we get into what I think is probably the heart of what I came to tell you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I can pause for any comments or questions right now. The only comment I, I, I have right now, um, Mark, is that H406 did get moved to the Commerce Committee. Um, and so it sits oh, in correct. We actually asked for that. You, uh, we actually asked you to do that. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I, I thought for a minute that I had to think for a minute if I if I did. Yep. I oh, you did. It. You did it yep. quick. I checked it out. It was mentioned and it's been recommitted. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's no, over. No, here. No. We've actually started. Yeah. Um, I, I apologize. No, that's okay. Just um, but that's really it. It's um, continue on. Fantastic. Uh, and I'm also willing to entertain any comments or questions, Mr. Chairman, from anybody else on the committee at this time, if there are any. Um, I see no hands raised right now. Not yet. Fantastic. So there's this group of folks, um, and they're they're called. Uh, we call them in COBRA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And they've been doing a lot of this work in uh, reparations for a while. And they say that it's a process of repairing, healing, restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families. 
those groups that have been injured have the right to obtain from the government, corporation, institution, or family responsible for the injuries, that which they need to repair and heal themselves, that which they need to repair and heal themselves. In addition to being a demand for justice, it is a principle of international human rights. So this is, in COBRA, they've been doing the work in our communities and across our society for decades. They're at the forefront. Please uh, Google, if you will, I, I hate to use it as a verb, um, in COBRA and file that away for future testimony, please. Again, that which they need to repair and heal themselves and a demand for justice a principle of international human rights law. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide. I usually, it's important to understand that the first time that reparations occurred in America was folks who uh, previously owned slaves and lost them, the government paid them back $300 a slave after uh, slavery was abolished, quote unquote. That was reparations. Again, former slave owners, were paid $300 for each slave that they had to give up. Now on part two, the, some of the slaves that, that remained unclaimed tried to go back and just turn themselves in and get the money for themselves. You can probably imagine how that worked. What happened was is um, right after the Civil War, Edwin Stanton and General Sherman, they met up with some black ministers and eventually they came out with this field order called number 15. And this is where the whole story of 40 acres and a mule happened. Um, not only did, did blacks were, were black folks provided uh, 40 acres, and there were upwards of four uh, of a thousand, four four thousand, I think it was, folks, um, for one thousand, ten thousand, ten thousand folks. Um, but there, they also received eligibility for um, the military, and it was so serious that they had an inspector that was appointed, appointed to ensure that this was all happening. Well, after, after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, when Johnson came in, he, he gave amnesty to all of the former slaveholders in the South, and he also revoked all of the grants that were given to, of land. Um, there was, uh, it was estimated of 400,000 acres that was taken back. Uh, from black folks uh, in the South, look, uh, along the South Carolina and Georgia basin there. Uh, these are the facts. So the, uh, the legislature attempted to, um, they, well, they actually passed the law. They, they, they went through the legislative process, but it was vetoed. They tried to replace this, this um, rep reparatory, reparatory um, action that the former Lincoln administration had uh, had uh, put in place uh, after Johnson revoked it, but Johnson vetoed it. Um, there's more to talk about with, uh, you, know, you know, various other activities that have occurred uh, over time where things have been, um, act activities have taken place that are, were, are reparative in nature, which I won't go into. I did want though, however, to speak about, which I think was overlooked by Ledge Consul, is, is that the, the House of Representatives did offer an apology. Maybe Ledge Council did say this, I don't, I'm not sure. I did think it was relevant to this discussion, is, is it was uh, the Resolution 194, the House of Representatives in the United States uh, in um, 2008 did offer an apology for slavery. So the reason why I pause here is, is because this is a little known fact. I don't know why they don't teach it in schools, but again, this is part of the work of H387, because as you recall, this is not just about a group of folks going off and making some decisions on whether to give black people a bunch of money. This is, this is a policy that calls for folks to go, go back, do a deep dive, uncover as much as they can. And also one of their charges is to figure out how to teach others, if you miss that. Uh, one of the ways in which they, um, they're executing their responsibilities is coming back with proposals on how to teach folks what it is that they discover. So if you, th if you think that's a big deal, the Senate also, um, they also offered an apology and that was the following year. 
and I'm, maybe we were so distracted in, in being excited about having a black president that we missed the fact that the United States Senate actually apologized for slavery in 2009. Note the disclaimer. So there, there's a um, there's there's a lot of work that's gone in and reparatory work that's gone in. We've got we've got the Japanese internments. There's still ongoing reparations being paid for Jewish for Jewish survivors of uh, Nazi war crimes. Um, you know, the the Indian Claims Commission was a you know was a big mess, a debacle. You know that the shame and embarrassment on the on the United States government, even how they handled that, but still nonetheless. We get credit. Yes, we apologize for Hawaii. Um, there, there's the Tuskegee experiment. OCO, uh, oh, I can never say this. Oh, I'm just going to say Okoe uh, acknowledgement of 2018. If you don't know what that is, that is one of the hundreds of massacres uh, that were executed with impunity, um, where black villages, black towns, or black people uh, were killed. Towns were burned down, or uh, black folks were just lynched. We hear a lot about um, Black Wall Street. Some of us are starting to learn more about Rosewood, which is the next one. Um, maybe you have heard of Wilmington. There are others. Um, so these are some of the areas where reparatory work should be, but mostly has not been done across the United States. Uh, but those are some additional examples. I, I think the um, Chicago police brutality, again, this is all, you know, this is all out there. This reparatory work, it's all you know, available for folks to see. It's available for folks to read. In fact, there's this group called MORE. Um, this group called MORE, Mayors Organized for Reparations and Equity. And uh, you, you probably have heard Mayor Garcetti's name in Los Angeles, and Michael uh, Hancock is a little less known, but they co-chair this thing. And they, they, this, there are 11 cities that have signed up, you know, we've got Rhode Island's right down the street, um, Providence. Um, but what we've got is we've got a group of mayors who, who said that they want to, quote, serve as high profile demonstrations for how the country can more quickly move from conversation to action on reparations for Black Americans. So again, these folks have have really come together. And what you probably noticed over the last couple of years, uh, post George Floyd, and also with the presidential, with the 2000 election, you've seen uh, presidential candidates and other candidates across the state speak out and speak out loudly on this whole idea of the need for reparatory work to happen in the United States. And we and we know at the heart of this is, is the fact that we're just a nation that never reconciled with slavery. We never, we never reconciled with the Civil War, um, which is why you get things like January 6th. So in addition to that, there's more here. Because if you just, again, do a surface search, and I pulled this up in 10 minutes yesterday after watching your testimony, uh, the previous testimony, all of the, everything you see on this slide. Um, so the Theo Virginia Theological Seminary recently did some work as well as Princeton and Georgetown in terms of uh, work. You probably saw Georgetown in the news uh, because I think it was 270 um, descendants of, of folks that were sold in order to fund Georgetown. I won't get into the details on um, the Theological Seminary at Virginia or Princeton. And the point here is, is you probably, you don't have to go back very far with any church, with any school, with any institution, and God knows what we've, what we've got buried here. We were, we were watching something the other day uh, to where Mississippi buried quite a bit uh, to where they sealed records for 50 years. And as a result of the unsealing of those records, not only was there um, closure, but there was also some, some, you know, some, some prosecutorial action that happened. Um, I won't get stuck on that, but here you see the te Texas Episcopal Diocese. Um, you see the Jesuit Conference. And these are all recent. These are all recent here when you start looking at um, the um, 
the fund for reparations. Now, um, Elaine, Arkansas, again, Elaine, Arkansas is yet another one. Please do your uh, homework on this if you have the opportunity. The, um, Mr. Chairman, Elaine, Arkansas, I think I even saw a, a show about it, like a documentary about it. It was awful where there's a whole community that's just massacred. Um, so for those who say, who push back and say, well, I don't know whether this work is necessary. Why can't we just let it be? You know, it's not just about slavery. It's about everything that it caused and all of the damage that it did because there's generations of children, generations of people. In fact, you know, a indigenous African-American person, and this is, you'd have to, you know, go back to testimony uh, on a clinical professional, maybe bring in Representative Chena, but there's this thing uh, that there is a generational trauma that comes down from slavery itself. Now, I'm, I'm not here qualified to speak on that, but uh, what I will say to kind of put the icing on the case of this slot, uh, on, the, on this slide, put the icing on the slide, is the state of California signed into law a reparations bill while nobody was looking. Now, this was, this was two years ago, almost two years ago. So there was, there was this conversation happening in testimony as I'm watching you yesterday. And, you know, it occurred to me that maybe somebody should just do a little digging. Uh, and I don't, I have no idea why Ledge Council uh, was not able to come across with uh, or come up with the fact that, yeah, we've got a we've got a state that's as large as the economy is maybe the fourth country, the fourth largest country in the world that already signed up to do it. Right in front of us. So this is this is some of the um, and, and, if, and if you detect frustration in my tone, it's only because we got to do the work, folks. And that's the whole point of this this um, this task force, and, and it's to me, it's mind boggling. It's actually skullduggery to sit here and have this conversation about this, where we've got qualified attorneys that they can't even, you know, peel the peel the first layer of the onion back on this thing. And the whole thing that what we're talking about here is is getting somebody to peel the first layer of the onion about uh, back on this thing in terms of um, establishing this task force. So it's just blowing my mind. So yeah, you get, again, you, you guys, uh, the Mr. Chair, your committee is familiar with me and, and who I am. So this is what you get, you get what you get. Uh, I just came to tell you the truth. This is my testimony. HR 40 passed out of, uh, it was voted out of House Judiciary for the first time in 33 years, 34 years. You didn't get that. You didn't get that in your testimony from your legislative council, and you didn't get that from anybody else. You got it from me. So, again, this bill was introduced in the 100th Congress. Now we're in the 117th Congress, and it passed for the first time in history. And it took me to come here to tell you that. That was in April of last year. This is not that. This is not that. So H H96 is something else. Now, H96 is probably not a bad idea. I just want to, and you did get this, but I want to reiterate it, is it's different. It's different. Because what, what we're talking about here is, is and I just want to read this, because if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Chairman, it's a short bill. It's... um short form rather, the bill proposes to create the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Development Task Force to develop and submit to the General Assembly a proposal for legislation to create one or more Truth and Reconciliation Commissions to examine and begin the process of dismantling institutional, structural, and systematic discrimination in Vermont, both past and present. The task force shall be composed of both voting and non-voting members and voting members, and I'll stop there, at what point are we going to talk about slavery? You see, for far too long have we tried to solve a problem that we have not been willing to name. What is very, very important about 387, and we knew this was coming, we saw this coming before the beginning of this, before you were elected this term. 
because this was as we as I said last time I was in this committee, we we saw this coming from your committee. So we intentionally, as I told you last time, put forward 387 as House Government Operations put 478 to bed last the last biennium. We intentionally brought it forward because specifically with three with 387, just like uh, H40, HR40 says, consistent with what the United Nations is telling us is, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to stay focused on solving this issue. It's a hard conversation. I get it. I get it. But this, this is not that. Just to be clear, this is not that. So I'm not going to go into jurisdictions and all that other stuff. I think we've. You, I think you know that there is a task force, a, a a a reparations task force here in the city of Burlington, which has existed for over a year, which Hal Colson chairs. So, what's coming out of that? We don't know. Maybe we should ask some of the folks who are on the committee. Maybe that's a, a great, great, great thing to do. I don't know. But I, I, I do think that at the time that this original presentation was made, there were multiple states that were doing multiple things. There are multiple jurisdictions and this list could go on and on. And I didn't bother to update this slide yesterday. Some of the other folks that you could po possibly consider bringing in for testimony. And we're not we're not organizing uh, the, these organizations. We're not we're not doing that. We, we brought the policy to you. We've, we've told you, we've told you um, what our position is on it. We've told you what other states and what other jurisdictions are doing. We've given you uh, what the United Nations says about it. Uh, we've connected the dots and, and told you what the importance is. We've told you um, what the United States has, has done on this up to date in terms of the apologies, in terms of the passage of HR 40, uh, as the United Nations asked them to do. If this committee is interested in taking additional testimony, um, we would suggest that maybe you might consider some of these organizations. Our demands are intentional. Uh, we're asking uh, for a reparations task force. Uh, we asked last uh, biennium. Uh, no action was taken in the House government operations. Uh, you know that you know, as I said before, you know, Burlington they recently launched one, and and um, and really, what I came to tell you is, is that Vermont, we have an obligation to address this crime against humanity uh, by empowering a task force to do the research, to do the research, uh, to do the research, and figure out what role Vermont actually has played in this process, and then you know, create some proposals. I think what this the research does is it it uncovers more. Um, I think. Today, I probably brought some things to you uh, that you've never heard before. Some of them um, are probably uncomfortable truths. And um, that's, that's what this thing is all about. Our, our, our past is filled with uncomfortable truths. It's about how we face them. Do we argue about it? Do we deny them? You know, do we, you know, do we um, choose to, um, to go in a downward spiral in, in, in guilt and, and somehow or another um, make it about um, you know, that, that, that maybe there's some kind of conspiracy or, or um, there's some kind of um, conscious effort to, to discredit who we are as a nation or to make us feel bad about who we are as a nation or who we are even, as, you know, as a race and, and because of our race. No, I mean, it, this is all about the sum of us um, and that's S-U-M. And it, we got to be able to get, you know, get busy and do this work together, take it serious and understand that, you know, that we're, we're all not going to be better unless we're all better. And, um, and that means, you know, something as simple as taking responsibility and, and um, you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up into the fact that, well, I wasn't there and I didn't own slaves. Um, you know, and I, and I think, um, and I, and I actually somewhat regretful of a, the, um, part of the exchange that I had with uh, Representative Parsons last time I was here. Um, but it was a point that I was trying to make, and that is, is that we own it. Well, you know, whatever, you know, whatever we, you know, whatever we do as a nation, we are a nation. I'm a, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. You know, um, I'm, you know, I'm an Iowa born and bred flag waving United States Army retired officer. Um, and um, so I own it. I, I own this nation. And I think we all have to own uh, where it is we've come from. 
and what it is we've done and, and how it's impacted us, um, you know, whether it's a, a, a selective group or whether it's, um, you know, in the individual level or whether, you know, whatever. So I thank you for the time. I'm going to take some questions and I, I just want to um, just reemphasize that there is work uh, to do and we have to, we have to just take the work seriously and understand that um, th there is no outcome that, that we should fear. Um, I think that um, the, the travesty of what's been happening at the national level is that is Uh, Representative Bloomley has a question. Hi, Mark. <clears throat> um, I am uh, one thing that you we should share with you is that um, uh, the H ninety six has been further developed um, with Ledge Council, <clears throat> um, and so what was a short form bill is now uh, a committee bill that. Um, we've just gone and taken a walk through on and um, I can share that with you for, and it's on the website. Um, the, the question I have, um, so I didn't act, I didn't know that 387 was a response to H96. And <clears throat> I think that H96 okay. is a, um, I mean, it, it, it can be what this committee wants it to be. And so the, the question I have is whether there is a way to it, essentially um, combine <clears throat> uh, your bill or fold it into the context of H96, um, which would address other forms of systemic um, discrimination. Because I think the original vision <clears throat> was from this committee that we had folks um, that there might be multiple commissions under kind of this umbrella um, that would look at different issues because they aren't the same for uh, individual communities that might um, be part of this process. Yeah, so I just, just want to back up. I appreciate the question and it, it's, 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 a, it's a good one. Um, first of all, I think I'm, I'm I may have been um, either misunderstood or, or maybe um, maybe you just misheard me. Is is that um, H three H three H three eighty seven is not a response um, to um, to H ninety six. Um, H three eighty seven is a response uh, to H four seventy eight uh, 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 nineteen twenty nineteen two thousand nineteen two thousand twenty legislative session. Uh, it was, as your alleged counsel told you, um, the policy is highly reflective. I think you received a number like 99%, which is probably a little high, but it reflects HR, not HR 40 at a, at, a, at a federal level, which has been in place for, uh, for 40 years, uh, for thir uh, 33 years. We, so this policy that you're looking at uh, couldn't possibly be a response to H96 because um, the policy after which it was modeled has been at the United States um, at the United States uh, legislature for the last 35 years. Um, and, and it's also been introduced in another form uh, the, as early as, as, as recent as uh, last, this last biennium of this body and where it hung on the wall in house government operations until it died. Uh, it was, if anything, maybe H96 might be um, um, a response to H478. Um, just to be crystal clear on this, because H uh, H ninety six did not exist uh, when we first introduced this policy uh, in the legislature uh, last uh, biennium. Now, uh, regarding your thought process on um, folding this policy into um, ninety six or any other policy, or the idea that there are a number of issues that need to be addressed. One would ask oneself, well, why haven't they folded HR 40 at the United States level into other policies? Certainly, they have uh, a responsibility to address uh, other demographics as well, uh, one would think. But it seems as though for the last 33 or 34 years, they've chosen not to. And I think um, I, my personal opinion on it is, is I think it's because of what HR 40 represents. 
as it pertains to the national responsibility for slavery. They named it HR 40 for a reason, and they named it HR 40 every single year of those 33 years. Every single year, HR 40 was reserved for that policy. Why? 40, 40 acres, 40. The reason why they did that is because they wanted to recognize and acknowledge Field Order 15 that I just taught you about earlier. They wanted to recognize and acknowledge the responsibility that we have as a nation that, that was actually reneged upon after the president was assassinated when all of that land was given back to former slaveholders and they were granted immunity. They wanted to acknowledge that and they wanted to do so, they wanted to do so emphatically. So now the decision in terms of what you decide, in terms of what you decide to do with this policy, obviously is yours. If you choose to fold this into any other policy, not to implement this policy or not to uh, adopt this policy or anything else, it's yours and yours alone. I've come to here to simply provide you the information that I think uh, obviously has been missing uh, to and to inform you to be able to um, give you the ability to act upon some, some information that would be useful. Um, but I, my hope is, is that this body would, um, would recognize and acknowledge um, the, the importance of the history of this, of this nation and the symbolism upon which the um, acknowledging of reparations would, um, would, um, would I guess, would, would communicate to communities here across the state as well as across the country. Um, I can see a tendency, I, I can see a, a propensity to want to, to pull back from that and to do something differently, um, either to make your job easier or to perhaps uh, to, to um, perhaps take the sting off, if you will, what it is that is being communicated. I respect that, I appreciate it, I understand it. And you know, I think it's good just to call it what it is, but let's just all go into this clear-eyed and understand what it is we're dealing with and then take responsibility for the decisions that we make. Mark, have you shared this, your slideshow with the committee assistant yet? I have not, I will though. I'm, I'm happy to do it, Mr. Chair. I would appreciate it. And just one, one um, we have to end this conversation now, but I just wanna say one thing. From a structural perspective, um, I heard criticisms about our legislative council and about the work that they did. And I just want to be very clear that the work that gets done, especially in an introduction and a bill that's introduced, um, legislative council works for the legislators. And so I would take on, if I were, if I were requesting this bill, I, the sponsors of this bill take on responsibility for, for the information that's in the bill. And so this wasn't the legislative council not doing a job. I mean, I know the writing may not have come up to a standard or included everything that you may have that you shared with us, and um, and I appreciate that as in addition to what's in the bill as as introduced. But I just want to be very clear that the fault, if there's any fault in the content, it lies with the legislators, and and not the attorneys. So, um, Mr. Chair, I'm. I realize that you have to get going, but I'm, I can't let that one go because um, really what, what I'm referring to is, is really not the content of the policy, not at all. Um, in fact, we take responsibility for the content of the policy. We wrote it. Um, what I'm talking about is the content of the research. Um, as I said, I, I did watch the, um, the introduction of the, of the bill uh, by Ledge Council. And I, and I did monitor very closely the exchange that you had with Ledge Council and what the Ledge Council was able to provide you. Uh, and so for the record, and for those who are watching, um, th there was an exchange that you had with Ledge Council and asked Ledge, Ledge Council for some background on some of the specific areas that I covered. And that, that exchange produced uh, little to nothing in terms of the reparative work, the specific reparations work that has been accomplished across the United States, most notably the fact that the United States um, ju ju uh, House Judiciary passed HR 40 in April of 2021 and the state of California 
passed a reparations bill. That is information that your legislative council should have had. And they should have been able to tell you that. So that it is things like that that I'm talking about. As far as the content of the policy, we take full responsibility for the content of the policy. Okay, no, thank you for sharing your thoughts and thank you for the presentation. Um, this is, uh, this is as you mentioned, a difficult, it was difficult to hear some of the truths that you were sharing with us and, and I appreciate I appreciate you doing that with us. And um, we, when we take this up again, you gave us a list of organizations. If you have a list of other witnesses in particular that, that you think would benefit to the, as you, as you challenged us earlier today to hear as many pros and cons as we can on this policy, um, please feel free to share them with us. Happy to do that, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your time. Would be most, it would be most appreciated if uh, Mr. Wild would, and, you know, would be able to provide us you know, maybe some target dates and or time slots that we might be able to, uh, to you know, bring those witnesses in. Obviously, uh, there are a lot of folks across uh, the state that are going to work with that we want to be able to have the opportunity to, to if, if at all possible, and we understand the legislature is very busy, but if it's at all possible, if, if we're able to, if we're going to bring a list of uh, uh, folks, you know, for this or 406, which we really would love to do, it would be very helpful for us to at least get nailed down uh, some some possible dates and maybe some times that that we we would be able to work in coordination with you much more effectively then. Sure. We will. Uh, we have a potential date for next week. Um, Ron will will communicate with you. I sent him um, the email this morning. Great. So that's in your email box. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Thank, Thank you, committee. We're going to take a 10-minute um, break.